joining me to discuss this is award-winning cardiologist and founder of Action on Sugar, Dr. Asim Malhotra. Uh, welcome to the programme, Asim. Okay. Um, do you think this is going to work? I mean, the, the goal, obviously, is, uh, is a laudable one. Um, but there's very mixed evidence about whether or not the sugar taxes actually reduce consumption, isn't there? Yeah, I think, first of all, John, let's put this in perspective. So poor diet now contributes to more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined. And when you look globally, the biggest factor, the public enemy number one in the Western diet, looking at scientific evidence now, is sugar. It's become unavoidable. It's added to more than 80% of processed foods. For children in particular in the UK, a third of all their sugar consumption comes from sugary drinks. And I think what's important for the public to understand is sugar has no nutritional value and there is no biological requirement whatsoever. So it's something we can do without. On top of that, John, you then look at the scientific studies at a very basic level. It's one of the only things we ingest that's directly corrosive to tooth enamel. In the UK, the commonest cause of chronic pain in children is tooth decay. The commonest cause of hospital admissions is tooth decay. Okay, so, I mean, you made the case that uh, diet's important and that sugar's important in diet. Uh, but what's the case that the sugar tax will really deal with that problem? Yeah. So if you look at in public, it's a very good question. When you look in public health terms, one of the ways, one of the comparisons we can make is the impact on reduction in smoking prevalence that's happened in the last few decades. And that's had the biggest impact in declines in coronary death rates, heart attack death rates. Now, the way that we, that came about was actually what we call um, addressing the three A's in public health, looking at the availability, the affordability and the acceptability of tobacco. And the same principles apply to sugar. Now, Oxford University researchers... Yeah, but, yeah, but what, what worked? You see, we've got, we've got to home in on the... On, the criticism is this, yeah. is that it's a one-note opera. The tax is a one-note opera, and actually what it does is it focuses our minds on something which isn't really effective, whereas the other things that you mentioned, education, availability, uh, might be more important. Well, actually, a tax on sugary drinks will is, is reducing the effective availability, if you like. So Oxford University researchers have done some very good studies on this particular, asking this particular question. What would happen if we had a 20% tax on sugary drinks, which in effect, this is what this will lead to. And within one year, that would prevent 180,000 people in the UK from becoming obese. I would actually argue that the effects are going to be much stronger because you've got all of the other chronic diseases that are now linked to sugar consumption that will reduce in prevalence very quickly. But you're absolutely right. We need time to see this happen, um, to see the effects, but we also need other measures. And I completely agree that education has a role, but the problem is education is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. And the problem is it's become so unavoidable that a lot of people are unaware of foods that they're eating that have hidden sugars in them. About 50% of our sugar but consumption... Keep, but we keep sliding away from tax to education, which I agree. And, sure. uh, and, and there's lots of evidence in the yeah. States, for instance, where there are some um, states in the United States have a sugar tax and some don't. Yeah. Some of the ones that don't have got a larger fall because of education programmes than some of the ones that have the tax. Yeah. Well, I'm not aware of that particular data, um, John, but yeah, you know, I agree that it needs to be a multifaceted approach, but this is certainly the first major population intervention step from a regulatory approach, and this is really what we need. I mean, if you actually look at even increase, and this is an important point, if you look at increase in life expectancy since 1900 in the Western world, we've had about a 30-year increase in life expectancy. 25 of those years have come from public health interventions, whether it's safe drinking water, seat belts in cars, smoke-free buildings. So, and because we have a population-wide problem here, type 2 diabetes in the UK costing the economy and the NHS about 20 billion pounds per year, failure to act will result in this doubling by 2035. It needs a population-wide approach, and this is a first step from the government of a population intervention by reducing consumption or aiming to reduce consumption of sugar, but at the same time, what this inadvertently also does, John, and you've hit on a very important point here, is it, it raises awareness that actually sugar is a problem, and that, in effect, is an education as well. You see, uh, one thing that obviously some of the critics are saying is um, George Osborne, frankly, couldn't give two hoots about this. Um, he's doing it because it's what journalists call a dead cat strategy. You walk into the room, you slap the dead cat on the table, everybody starts talking about the cat and not about, say, your failing economic record. Um, and people suggest that he's after the money, um, whereas, say, he could reduce, as one of the tweets said, he could reduce taxes on healthy food 
try and alter the consumer pattern that way, but he's not interested in doing that because there's no money in his pocket. It's a multifaceted approach, and I agree with one of your tweeters that said, you know, we need to make healthier food more affordable. Um, no doubt about it. What we need to do really is that we've got an imbalance at the moment. We've got an oversupply of cheap sugary food. We've got, uh, we've legitimized and normalized junk food as part of the normal diet and reduced the consumption of healthy food. And we now have rampant epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So we have to restore that balance. And I completely agree part of that strategy does involve and should involve making healthier foods more affordable. Mm. And what about some other things that people say might be equally, if not more, important? For instance, people suggest that in terms of sales, um, the end of aisle display in supermarkets has a bigger bump in sales um, than um, would be accounted for by price reductions. Um, they also say that, for instance, the kind of contracts, often PFI-type contracts that are entered into by hospitals and student unions where there are vending machines, which is full of this stuff, yeah. that this is as an important question as anything to do with the tax. Yeah. What do you think? Cam um, John, I've campaigned on both of those issues. Um, absolutely, candy at the cash register, we call it. So we know that, um, uh, that retailers will put, you know, they will pay uh, vendors uh, money to have products placed at certain places where they know um, the consumers are more likely to buy, you know, so, you know, at the end of the checkout till, for example, having a brightly coloured chocolate bar, despite wanting to lose weight, you're still tempted to buy it. They know that human behaviour is also influenced by the environment, the way things are promoted and where they're placed. Absolutely right. I completely agree. In terms of hospitals, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, we are, we've been sending out the wrong message for such a long time. And in 2013, I actually, um, I uh, uh, got a motion passed at the British Medical Association annual uh, conference, actually calling for a ban in junk food sale in hospitals. And it went with an overwhelming majority because actually what's interesting is 50% of NHS employees are actually overweight or obese, which is a clear example that education is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. And we've actually allowed um, our hospitals to become a branding opportunity for the junk food industry. So you're absolutely right. All of these measures need to be implemented. Mm. And what about the, the way, I mean, this will be a regressive tax, of course. It will hit poor people harder than it will hit. Uh, hit rich people. Um, George Osborne will barely notice this in his uh, in his budget. Somebody yeah. on the disability benefits that he's just taken off people will definitely notice. It. John, can I just pick you up on that point? It's very important. Uh, you know that people have used this argument of regressive tax, and you know you're demonising the poor. The same arguments were used about smoking when when prices of cigarettes were going up. What we're doing is we're removing essentially um, something that's consumed in very large quantities, which is a toxin when it's consumed in large quantities, from uh, the people who are worst affected. So they're going to have better health outcomes. But the alternative is water. So I don't, I don't buy this argument about being a regressive tax. You're removing effectively something that has no biological requirement, and the alternative is water. So I don't buy it. I don't buy that argument. Mm. But you know as well as I do that people are socially conditioned to this uh, in, in a rational world. OK, you stop drinking Coke, you start drinking water. Um, actually, people don't behave like that. Um, so what you're doing is, however bad it might be, you're taking something that people have become accustomed to, let's not say addicted, but accustomed to, sure. and you're taking it away from poor people in a way that you're not taking it away from rich people. I guess that would be the counter argument. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's more of a nudge rather than taking it away. You know, I think if people are, people are still going to be able to buy sugary drinks if they really want it, but it's just that extra you know, increase in price is probably going to make them think twice, and it's going to give them, you know, they're going to have to look for other things mm. to drink. But, you know, I, I, um, I think that... Uh, uh, it's going to actually have a bigger impact. I mean, if you look at social inequalities in health, um, although the obesity epi epidemic affects everybody to some degree, I mean, I don't think any socioeconomic class is immune to it. There is a disproportionate effect on people from poorer backgrounds, and actually they're more likely to get the health benefits as well. So would, would a more powerful public health intervention be better, say, instead of putting on a, 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 a sales tax, essentially, um, why not either legislate about the production of these uh, of these things or tax uh, the corporations or go after the people that are vending them? I mean, you know, great Jamie Oliver's there, you know, talking about this, but you go to Jamie's diner and there it is, all is on the venue. Yeah, I mean, it's a, again, it's about just nudging things in the right direction. But, you know, I think we've hit on a few points. It needs a multifaceted approach. This is one step of many. Um, I agree, you know, things like banning junk food advertising, you know, really important dissociation of junk food and sport. I mean, we had, you know, a great spectacle in 2012, the Olympic Games, and in the midst of an obesity epidemic, our main sponsors were McDonald's, 
Coca-Cola, Cadbury's and Heineken. That sends out entirely the wrong message. And in fact, actually the science tells us that you can't outrun a bad diet or a high sugar diet because a very good study done in Stanford University looked at sugar availability for consumption globally. And what they found was for every excess 150 calories of sugar that was available above your, uh, above your normal quota in the diet, um, compared to 150 calories from another source such as fat or protein, there was an 11 fold increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes independent of your body mass index, independent of physical activity, which basically means even if you're active and you're of a normal body mass index, if you consume too much sugar, you're significantly going to increase your risk of developing type 2 diabetes.